Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Sarah Van Tyne of Quantum 5 has assembled an all-star panel uh, to share with us their thoughts on going into the year ahead for your BDC. Uh, and I want to welcome Sarah back to the event. Sarah, welcome back to the conference. Ted, thank you so much for having me. This is going to be an amazing panel. I'm so excited to ask everybody some amazing questions and get their feedback about my favorite topic, BDC. Yes, I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, there are some new faces. So uh, what I will do, Sarah, I will step aside. Uh, I'll see you towards the end and I'll let you handle the uh, introductions and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Ted. Well, everybody, I would like to just first and foremost, thank you so much for being part of this panel today. I will go around the screen starting uh, with, with Bill. If y'all will just introduce yourselves to the Fixed Ops community and let them know a little bit about what you do and, and what your role is. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Yes, I'm William Demery. I'm with the Tom Wood Auto Group based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm the group's director of fixed operations and I have the opportunity to oversee about 25 or so different uh, business entities that uh, we operate even outside the automotive. So uh, keeps me busy, it's a lot of fun. I'm Brian Massal. I'm in Naples, Florida. I'm a managing partner of uh, four new car franchises in Naples, Audi Naples, Volkswagen of Naples, Naples Acura, and Naples Infinity. And a large part of my day is dedicated to uh, the success of our fixed operations department. My next, Sarah? Yes, go right ahead, Andy. Fantastic. Uh, my name is Andrew Wright. I'm the managing partner of the Vinart dealerships here in Allentown, Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Philadelphia, an hour west of New York City. We have uh, five franchise locations with Acura, Honda, Hyundai, Mercedes-Benz, and Porsche franchises. And uh, we also operate the area's largest collision center. Very fixed ops oriented and uh, very happy to be here to talk about this important topic. So thank you for having me. I'm Nikki Risley. I'm the Chief, op Chief Operations Officer here at uh, Daytona Dodge, Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, Fiat, Maserati, Alfa Romeo of Daytona. Um, most of my background is in fixed ops. I, I grew up really in the business. I started as a receptionist, cashier, um, service advisor, uh, parts manager, service director, fixed ops director. And now I left the automotive business for about three years, missed it the entire time, um, had my second child and then decided to come back. So um, definitely fixed ops oriented. That's where my expertise is. And I'm also currently trying to learn the front end of the business as well. So I'm excited to be here. I love talking about fixed stops. Um, and Sarah is a wonderful partner. So I'm excited to be here and brainstorm and talk about what we love. Thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Martin. I'm the service BDC manager for Scott Clark, Toyota, Honda, and Nissan um, in Charlotte and the Matthews area. I have been working in BDC for about almost seven years now and slowly worked my way up. And there was my former boss and she's my mentor now. I'm very excited to be here. Well, again, thank you all for being here today. This is so exciting to get to pick the brains of some of the best in the business when it comes to BDC. So with that, I wanna go ahead and kick it to this wonderful panel and start asking some questions. And hopefully the dealers that are listening here today, y'all can pick up some great tidbits to apply to your organization as well. So first and foremost, my first question to the group, you know, 2022 was a record year at many dealerships across the country. And thinking of that, what was your BDC's biggest accomplishment in 2022? Uh, first, I think I'll kick this question to Andy first. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, we we had uh, we had quite a few accomplishments that we were very proud of in uh, 2022. But on the service side, uh, I was probably most proud of our team's effort in uh, the outbound campaigning that we did. Um, you know, so much of what we've done historically, so much of the success that we've enjoyed, has been the direct result of uh, the way we've treated our customers. It's kept them coming back, the amount of repeat business. Obviously, that's always great to see. That's what we all strive to achieve. 
Um, but that there's still a, a very large pool of clients that are out there, whether those are people that bought a car from us and didn't come back to see us yet. Perhaps they're new to the area, they're new to the brand, they bought a, a used car elsewhere. And uh, using some of uh, the resources we have with some of our data partners and uh, some of our OEM partners, uh, we really put together what I think were some outstanding outbound campaigns using a combination of outbound uh, telephone calls, uh, some AI, uh, some text messaging, uh, and uh, as well as some social outreach. And that, uh, that resulted in record outbound campaigning for us that yielded results that we were very proud of. So uh, it was a record year for fixed operations for the company. I'm very proud to say that. Excellent, Andy. And you touched on such an important point, which is really the outbound generation, right? And, and making sure that you're reaching out to your customers and farming that relationship and keeping front and center in their retention experience. And I want to turn that same exact question uh, to you, Brian, because I know your organization does an incredible job with your BDC. So what was your BDC's biggest accomplishment in 2022? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, 2022 had, a, had its share of, of uh, challenges for us in a variety of ways. Um, I think, you know, with that is, is also what some of our highlights stemmed from. Um, we uh, we were the unlucky recipients of Hurricane Ian, uh, excuse me, Hurricane Ian in September, and um, our market Naples and 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 Fort Myers, Southwest Florida was was impacted significantly. Uh, we we rapidly developed a, a protocol and plan for our customers that were affected. We had approximately fifty five thousand total losses in our marketplace. Um, I don't have a spot to park fifty five thousand cars, so. Uh, just you know, finding creative ways to accommodate our customers and and uh, find alternative transportation in a lot of in a lot of examples, um, and you know, put many people at ease at, at a time that was you know clearly very stressful for them. Um, so I think we all had sort of a feel good moment uh, in, in that, despite it being you know, a very difficult four or five week uh, timeline there. Um, and then separately, we we really focused a lot on just some of the basic KPIs throughout the year. Um, we've uh, Geographically, we, we are really limited on uh, within our workforce, and we've had a difficult time adding staff to BDC despite uh, despite needing them. Um, and uh, we, we pushed our team quite a bit, and they responded. And we actually had a number of uh, record KPIs, um, like uh, like show rate, as an example. So I think we're we're working more efficiently. We're finding ways to uh, ensure that our staff is happy and and uh, and create that competitive nature within our BDC department. So those are my two. Wow. I mean, that overcoming, you know, the challenge of, a, of the storm as well. I mean, that that is such a testament to, again, your people and your organization and your community in rallying together to support your customers. And I know, Nikki, you experienced kind of a, a similar, you know, a similar challenge as well, being in that Florida market. So for, for 2022, I'll, I'll pose that same question to you. What what was your BDC's biggest accomplishment uh, in 2022? Well, uh, the creation of our service BDC would be our biggest accomplishment. Um, you know, I have worked <clears throat> collectively uh, at the dealership for about 18 years now. And it, it just took us a long time to realize the importance of an actual service BDC. And I feel like so many dealers fight that, right? Maybe most dealerships have an appointment coordinator, right? That is not a service BDC. Um, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we finally took that step that said, yeah, we need full staff. We need um, a schedule of work. We need um, scripts. We need outside help. We've used Quantum 5 um, to help us establish that and provide ongoing training. So I think our biggest accomplishment is just, hey, yeah, we need a service BDC. And since the the creation and implementation of, of that, I can't even begin to tell you um, the lift that we've seen, not only in appointments, appointment shows, uh, uh, CEI, um, just a total transformation in the way that we handle customers, 
um, from phone calls to text messages, from appointment setting to follow up. It's just, if you have an appointment coordinator or you don't have an appointment coordinator or you have nothing, you need a service BDC. And, and I will tell you, it probably took us, that it's embarrassing to say, but probably 10 years to realize we need to take the next step. And it has been well worth it, well worth it. So that that is mine, is the creation of the BDC. <laughs> Well, it's been so exciting to see the developments you've had and the success, Nikki. So I'm looking forward to seeing the continuation of that beginning of uh, what started in 2022 into 2023. And now I want to pivot to, to another topic, which is really talking, and we've touched on this, a couple of you already have, but around employee retention and keeping BDC employees. Of course, the employees are really important to maintaining a strong BDC and having that customer engagement and that customer satisfaction, having employees that really care about the people uh, in your community and the people that you do business with. So with Bill, I want to pose this question to you. You know, we see a lot of compelling data showing employee retention leads to more gross profit in dealerships. Uh, what are some strategies you currently implement in your organization to retain top BDC talent? Yeah, thanks. So that's a great question. Um, and it's something we all struggle with. And one of the things we realized um, kind of right after COVID is the value of the BDC employee. And as stores were winding down, we were winding up in the BDC versus uh, the other way. And we realized quickly from a pay structure standpoint, how much were we really appreciating our BDC agents? And were we offering training like we do for our uh, fixed ops departments and service managers and variable. So we adopted um, uh, a few programs. One, we're doing ongoing training and we as uh, well have uh, utilized Quantum 5 and um, it's been really rewarding for our team. And then we took the team and split it. So we generated a um, luxury BDC uh, versus a non-luxury BDC. And that kind of gives us a, a second tier in our BDC for kind of growth, that growth opportunity and showing a career path. Uh, we also implemented a gift card, kind of a points bonus every month. Uh, they have opportunities. Uh, we start with a point system and uh, they can earn uh, gift cards uh, by the end of the month. And it just shows that we appreciate them. Uh, we care for them. And uh, by putting all these monthly incentives together, it, it really has helped our call volumes. Uh, it's helped our attendance. It's helped our evaluation rates. Um, and certainly you throw training on top of it and pay. Uh, pay is really uh, a top thing, uh, I think, in, in our organization is if the competition is paying this, we want to pay this. And you have to appreciate your employees. So that's really helped uh, kind of grow RBDC. The luxury division has been really wonderful. We're in the middle of training one of our luxury agents wants to be a service consultant. So um, he's an NCM uh, service manager training, right, or service advisor training uh, currently, and he'll start job shadowing uh, by February and hopefully have a spot for him in one of our luxury stores. So uh, we're really excited to be able to promote from without in, in that department. Those are such great points, Bill, and I, I really hope everybody was paying attention to that. There's, there's so much opportunity to grow your people from within your organization. And of course, having people within the BDC department, they really are so aware of so many different facets of the dealership and the customer experience. It just makes really good business sense. If you can find somebody in the organization that you can grow like that, it, it really pays dividends down the line. Uh, Elizabeth, I wanna pose that same question to you too. So you know, what are some strategies you currently implement in your organization to retain top BDC talent? That's a great question as well. Um, so there's a couple of different strategies I've been able to implement in our BDC. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, one of them is being able to offer a flexible schedule to our employees and having a healthy work-life balance. Um, I have several employees that have families, children, and also want to have um, a life outside of work, dealership. And so I try to be accommodating as possible and work with them and offer different shifts 
and we also have a Saturday rotation. So rather than requiring everyone to work every single Saturday, um, we give them the opportunity to work every other Saturday. And another thing that I do to help retain top talent is that I do um, monthly one-on-one um, performance evaluation. So what I do is I look at the metrics and the numbers and um, and I listen to the calls and see what I can do to help them grow and move up and earn more money as well. And I al- always want to encourage people to um, really go out of their way to help people. And I also encourage them to ask me as many questions they want. If they if they're wanting to learn how to um, grow their skill set, I want to offer training. If they want to eventually become a manager, if a BDC manager, I definitely want to help them grow and reach, reach their fullest potential. And those are really great points, aligning their personal goals alongside the business and the professional uh, goals as well. That really helps, especially having those monthly one-on-ones, having that discussion, keeping things top of mind as they progress. Um, and Andy, I want to take that question back to you as well, because I know you you have a lot of strategies within your organization. What are some of the strategies you currently implement um, within your BDC to retain top talent? Sure. So I, I really value what Bill had to say. I think uh, a lot of, of, of what he's doing is emblematic of what it takes to be successful uh, in operating a modern day BDC, just from the standpoint of uh, if you're going to try to do something on a shoestring budget, um, it's going to be difficult. Um, and uh, so I, I, a lot of the things that, that he does, I mean, I actually wrote a note down about the, uh, the gift card points bonus. I like that one. That's a great idea. Um, and we're always looking for fun ways to sort of break up what can sometimes perceive, be perceived as the monotony of the job, right? So, um, you know, we do try to incorporate some fun things into the day to, to break things up, whether it's a, a power hour bonus contest um, where we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do a, a one hour segment of calling and we'll have a contest regarding appointments or outbound calls or, or you name it. So I think it's really all about keeping it fun and keeping it fresh. Uh, and, and to maybe piggyback a little bit on what Elizabeth was saying, we, we are, are also trying to pursue scheduling that is as flexible as people would like to have because they do have, you know, families with young children or whatever. So it's, it's important that we're as accommodating as possible. We've even gone uh, to the length of having um, uh, offsite people working from home uh, as long as they're able to uh, adhere to our standards and uh, produce at the levels we're looking for. We're even willing to be uh, flexible along those lines. And, and we're able to keep tabs on things through listening to calls and, and things of that nature. But I think the I think the, the big takeaway is just you need to be flexible. Uh, rigidity will be a killer uh, if you're trying to uh, get something off the ground or even sustain something or grow something into uh, what can really be a revenue generating machine. Now, those are great points, Andy. And uh, you touched on so many great pieces there in terms of how to how to really structure and keep talent and think think ahead about some of the, the challenges that you might face as a business and just keep that flexibility. Uh, this next question I really want to um, to pose to, to Brian and Nikki first uh, and then Bill as well. Um, and even uh, Elizabeth and Andy, please chime in on this this too. But we've seen a lot of changes uh, since 2020, really. A lot of ways that customers have chosen to do business with us, shop for vehicles, schedule and pay for service, and interact with our businesses. We've seen a total change in in some of the strategies. And of course, you know, in, in 2022, some things went back to, to normal a little bit, but we've also seen some things that are kind of here to stay. And we also see a lot of insights though. So with the advent of technology and with the additional ways that people can do business, we also see insights that show customers really still at the heart value a great customer service experience. And they really consider this heavily before they make a decision on where to do business. Uh, so, so first I'll go to Brian. What is a way your BDC uh, employees help to elevate your customer experience? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know the root of BDC development was was for this very question. Um, generally speaking, many of us have sales focused backgrounds in automotive, and if uh, if we walked by and saw an unanswered sales call, 
I think we, we know everyone's response in the showroom um, and service and parts, frankly, have never been treated the same. And, and I think that's a lot of, of all that we're trying to implement, you know, very simply, uh, the customer expectation is, is fairly basic. They want to pick up a phone. They want to have someone answer the call and frankly, be able to answer the questions that, that they have. So um, we, uh, we, we, we really just have, have gotten simple and, you know, we need an immediate response. So a, a direct, uh, a direct way to contact. So we use a, a hunt group in our, in our phone system, which probably every store has available to them. Uh, a simple way to reach a, a service associate. We redirect all inbound uh, advisor calls um, as, as often as a customer would like to speak to an advisor. Generally speaking, it's a big disruption to another customer. Um, and, and frankly, there's, there's often a lot of wasted time in that. So our BDC has the capacity to review history of the car, um, provide status updates, uh, and, and we, we train a lot on, on how to sort of uh, transition that, that question with the customer because oftentimes they're so fixated on, I need to talk to my advisor. And, and I would say 80% of the time, it's totally unnecessary. Um, and pricing, pricing is, has taken a ton of energy and, and a lot of time. Um, we, have, we have several tools that, that make it uh, very easy for a, a consultant to provide accurate pricing as it relates to um, you know, a customer's repair or service. Um, you do need to generate very specific labor operations and there's a lot of nuances and you know, we, we, we use X time as an example. Um, and, and you really have to give, give a lot of focus and energy to making sure they're accurate. But for a customer to call and say, hey, I want to have four tires put on my car. What is that cost? Um, it shouldn't take three transfers to three different departments and hope, hope that someone answers. Right. So, um, so yeah, I would say, you know, in summary, we want to pick up the phone right away. We want to give them accurate information and we want to be able to answer their questions intelligently. And that's, that's, I think all of our focus. I wholeheartedly agree, Brian. I mean, that, that is really at the foundational core of, of a solid BDC is having that customer focus strategy where you're not transferring, having uh, you know, limited, uh, training limited accountability with your BDC reps where they're not able to answer those customer questions. So, so kudos to you for having that kind of environment for your customers where they can speak to somebody and get those questions answered and keep your service advisors doing what they do best. I think we learned from the best there. I'm not sure, but. <laughs> well, Nikki, I want to, I want to ask that same question to you. You've been in fixed operations for a very long time and, and, and Bill, I'll, I'll pose it to you as well. Both of you have you know tremendous fixed ops experience. Uh, what, um, you know, what do your BDC employees do with your organizations to help elevate your customer's experience? Well, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's humans talking to humans. And I think a lot of times we, we miss that component. We get all stressed and tense and almost ready to do battle a lot of times, uh, you know, on the fixed ops side of things. So it's just talking to people and having a, just some empathy, right, for their situation. Nine times out of 10, if they're trying to communicate with our service department, it's already probably not a good situation. We all want them to come in for maintenance services and, and all of that, but usually it's because they have an issue. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, ditto to a lot of what Brian said. You know, if if they're they're calling we give them the ability to speak to a human being. Uh, we route all of our calls uh, to the BDC. If for some reason the service advisor does not pick up the phone, th there's no voicemail anymore because, you know, we know service advisors, they're too busy a lot of times to, to answer voicemails, right? So we, we route those calls. They ring three times and they go to the BDC. Um, if the customer wants to text message, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people, though we are humans speaking with humans, a lot of times it's way more convenient to shoot a text. And so our BC reps have that capability to speak via text. They can uh, talk to people over email. However, the customer would like to be communicated to, our BDC team has that capability and they respect that. Um, we have dealer FX white labeled as Y advisor for CDJR stores. Um, the BDC has a capability 
to go in, look at statuses of vehicles and provide some basic information. Um, if there is something that needs a little bit more involvement or information from the service advisor, then we have internal communication that they can reach out to the service advisor and get a little bit more information. Um, so we have that. Um, additionally, our BDC also does this, the uh, follow-up calls um, for uh, customers. If there's any concerns that they've had that we've not been able to, um, to correct, um, the BDC team is responsible for getting that information, getting it to our service director, and he then follows up um, with what the resolution might be. So it's just being able to handle customers. Um, we're actually too, <clears throat> again, and we're in development of this, but we are also starting um, at delivery. The BDC team is a part of the um, tour that the customer gets when they, when they purchase a vehicle. Um, and they'll set up the first uh, service appointment right there with our BDC team. Um, so people already now have a face with the name when they call in to speak to someone, they're they're going to know a lot of times who they're speaking with, which I think is very important because the BDC team are the people typically, if the customer's not serviced a vehicle with us prior or purchased the vehicle from us, a lot of times the BDC is going to be, we hope that they are the first impression um, of our dealership. And we don't want a customer to call three times, four times, get a voicemail, get transferred, not get the information that they want, get frustrated, and then just drive in and then have a poor experience from there as well. So the BDC part of this is at the forefront of what makes a good customer experience. And I am a true, true believer of that. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. It's it's awesome to hear some of the strategies that you've implemented and it's such a short time too with, with your store in 2022. Um, Bill, Bill and Elizabeth, I want to get your final thoughts on that subject too. So, um, you know, Bill, I'll get to you first, but just final closing thoughts on that. What are some ways that your team, uh, your BDC specifically is elevating your customer's experience with your group? Yeah. And I think uh, Brian and Nikki really said it well, and it's, they answer the phone and, I came through uh, as a service advisor, so I know when the phone's ringing off the hook and I have a, a guest, I'm not answering the phone as an advisor. So I was quick on uh, forming a, a big BDC center here for our group and it's housed out of our, our home office. Uh, they're off site. They're in one location. Uh, we can monitor and listen. Uh, I love going in there and I challenge all of our managers, come in anytime, pick up a headset and listen into the calls. And uh, we can coach, we can, we can do a much better job, but at the end of the day, they answer the phone and they take care of the customers. And uh, it's, it's a much uh, more delightful experience than uh, service. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, very professionally done and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Elizabeth, I'll, I'll let you wrap up this before I go into our, our last question. So how does your BDC department elevate the customer experience at your stores? So um, I agree with everything that Brian, Bill, and Nikki have said, but I'd like to add on to, um, we actually made the decision to get, get kind of get rid of the script. So rather than following it verbatim, word for word, we were able to kind of like tailor it a little bit and kind of speak on the customer's level based on, you know, the social style. Um, you know, you may have a customer that's like super direct and they just want the information right then and there we are able to kind of listen and pick up on that and be able to change our communication style to match their level. Um, and I think that kind of goes a long way with customers and help with customer retention because nobody wants to call a call center and have someone follow right off the script and be kind of sound like a robot and be able to do that. You sound more human, it's more personalized. And I think that's something that's really helped elevate the customer experience by getting rid of the script. Awesome point, Elizabeth. And, and I think that that too is so critical and in the next phase, right? Because people realize when someone is reading something with little energy or they're just reciting and regurgitating something verbatim that they've said a million times, it's, it is so much more impactful when a customer feels like they're heard and they're being listened to. And the person really is 
communicating with them in the manner that they want. Well, now we're here at our, our lightning round question. So I'm going to ask the entire panel this question. Uh, I'm going to start with Andy, go to Nikki, then Elizabeth, Brian, and Bill. I'll let you close it out. Um, but I'm going to ask everybody this, this big question because I know this has been something in 2023, especially a lot of OEMs are focusing on. And so I'm sure if you're an OEM that's listening to this panel today, you're going to agree with this question and you're going to want to hear from these experts some of the strategies that they're tackling this. So Andy, you first, we'll kick it to you. Many OEMs are really focusing this year and continuing to focus. They've, they've been focusing for years, but now even more so are focusing heavily on customer retention. What are some ways that you are tackling this initiative with your BDC? Well, first, I want to start off by saying that uh, I'm largely supportive of these uh, you know, shifts to focusing more on retention as opposed to chasing a CSI score. You know, I'm a big believer that there's really three questions we should be asking customers after, after every interaction we have with them. Number one is, you know, were you satisfied? Number two is, will you come back? And number three is, will you refer your friends and family? And I think if we can get affirmative answers on all three of those, I think it's, it's pretty highly indicative that they're going to be coming back to see us and we should experience high levels of retention. Now, with that being said, um, we all know that like most people, we're all uh, running busy lives and, and trying to do a lot of things. And uh, while we might rely on our cars to tell us when uh, we need to come in for service, uh, certainly in states like Pennsylvania, where we have annual state inspection and things of that nature, it's important that our BDC is, uh, is, is using those tools in terms of making sure that people are not missing out on an opportunity to update their state inspection, make sure that their, that their vehicle is operating at peak safety performance levels and things along those lines. It's not just all about maintenance, it's about uh, the complete ownership experience, the entire package of caring for the vehicle and making sure that they don't have to worry about issues with reliability or anything along those lines. So, uh, uh, so from a strategic standpoint, I support uh, the, the shift in that direction. I think it'll be a much more healthy way to approach um, how we're evaluating and assessing, and assessing our performance. And of course, BDC is going to be critical to ensure that uh, we maximize the opportunity to perform there as well. So um, yeah, I, I, I support it. Excellent. Nikki, so with, with your stores and, and your, your various OEMs, what are some ways that you're tackling the initiative of retention? So we actually just hired a new service director who I am insanely excited about. His name is David Sparks, and he is absolutely a very welcome member of the team. And he's brought a lot of good um, ideas uh, recently. And actually, Andy, um, I think he nearly said exactly the same thing that you said about, about, you know, we're not really so much fixated on the number, right? Because if we focus on retention and we focus on the things that we need to do to increase our retention or keep our retention at a high level, then the scores are, are going to be where they need to be anyway. Um, so I think uh, the creation of the BDC is a good start. Um, and then the initiatives on retaining customers um, in terms of ownership clinics, you know, we had gone away from those. So ownership clinics, the first oil change appointments um, at delivery of the vehicle. Um, we have some other, uh, some, some credit card incentives, but really whatever, whatever you're wanting to do in terms of retaining your customers, allowing the BDC team to be a part of that with their verbiages and their professional training, um, recommended services, that type of thing, all those, all those pieces of low hanging fruit that we've passed by, the BDC can now just roll with their wagon, right? And collect all these pieces of fruit. Um, so that is what I would say is allowing the BDC to take a large role in the initiatives that you as a dealership create to retain the customers. Um, like I said, first, first oil changes, ownership clinics, allowing them to do what they do best, communicate with the customer. Perfect, Nikki. That was a, that was a great answer as well. And Elizabeth, with uh, 
with the, your BDC, what are some ways that you're atta- you're tackling the OEM initiative of boosting retention? So one of the ways that we do is the outbound campaign calls that we do, um, service reminders. Um, I think Andrew mentioned that, you know, a lot of people rely on the car to tell them when the car is due for service. One of the things that the BDC does is that we go off the last auto history and the driving history. We call them and tell them, like, based on the last visit, um, the car may be due for service. Um, so we try to get them to come in and um, get the car service. And another thing that we do is to CSI. Um, one of the things we asked them, um, is there anything that you feel that we could improve on? What could have made it a solid 10 if it wasn't a 10? Um, and that's another thing that we do to help focus on customer retention. Brian, I- I'm going to put this question to you. So, you know, OEMs are focusing heavily on customer retention, uh, as Elizabeth uh, answered, and, and Andy and Nikki. What are some ways that, that you're all uh, tackling this initiative with your BDC as well? Yeah, look, so uh, you're not going to keep a customer if you don't provide a, a good experience. That's, I think everyone in one way or another has, has stated that. Um, so we, we try to be very accommodating, both in, uh, in the tools we're using to schedule and in things like alternate transportation, um, uh, better utilization of our, of our uh, calendars. Um, and we've also increased uh, uh, service hours. So we've, we've moved to a shift model for virtually every brand and have uh, gone from a, a half day on Saturday to a full day on Saturday with, with full staff. So we, we've opened up our capacities, which is which has been meaningful for us. Um, but uh, but, you know, all, all in the same in the same breath, the, the manufacturers, as much as they want to drive uh, retention, they've sort of done dealers a disservice uh, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, most of my Cars are now on 10,000 mile or, or annual maintenance cycles, which reduces the uh, the number of visits in a in a in average consumer's uh, year to the dealership. So we um, we really strive for three visits per year, despite you know in theory uh, only one service needed. Um, this started a number of years ago, and we developed our our own branded uh, well, uh, for each store we, we refer to as uh, Audi Naples Tire Care, Volkswagen of Naples Tire Care, and it's it's sort of a one, the one give, right? I think all too often we call and, and we ask for something. Um, you know, we, we want you to come in and service. We want you to come in and take advantage of a special. We're going to give you a discount. All, that, all that's great. Um, this is a freebie. So we, uh, we, we've had extraordinary success with it. And, and we see a car uh, every six months or 5,000 miles, regardless of, of service needs. Um, oftentimes there's no revenue. Uh, they get a they get a tire rotation and, and a car wash, but it's it's been a really uh, wonderful way for a customer to continue to connect with their advisor. Um, uh, you know, it's it's like a grocery store. I don't know why, but I shop at the same grocery store every time I go, so I'm comfortable there. I know where to look, and I know what aisle I'm shooting for, and that's uh, that's all we're trying to do: guide the customer uh, at least three visits annually, regardless of service needs or not. That's a great strategy, Brian, and. And thank you for sharing that that with all of us today. Bill, you're going to take us home. So last last lightning round question to you. How are you uh, and your team focusing on customer retention with your BDC this year? Well, I just took a lot of notes. So I have a lot of new processes from what these uh, folks just told me. So, um, you know, we have a, a, a lifetime powertrain warranty that we give all of our guests uh, free of charge when, when they purchase a vehicle and it, and it requires that they follow the OEM maintenance. So we do reminder calls to remind them uh, we don't want their warranty to be an issue. So we're doing reminder calls for their maintenance and just uh, helping them get scheduled in because if they try to schedule, we might be booked, but we'll make that a priority uh, to get them into our stores to hold the retention um, and keep their, their vehicles maintained because face it, who, who reads their owner's manual? You have no idea what the vehicle needs to have done. And, and the last thing we want is a failure in the vehicle and it gets denied because they didn't properly maintain. So our BDC is doing a wonderful job of tracking those and uh, helping on the outbound calls and outbound is where it's at. And uh, we've learned that over the last uh, year, year and a half that we have to be in the outbound calls. And uh, Quantum 5 kind of taught us uh, the, the, the way on outbound and we've adopted it uh, and we're gonna continue to adopt it through 2023. Well, Ted, I 
I see you've joined us. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to first off before I kick it to you, Ted, just thank everybody on this panel. I think there is some amazing information that all of them has shared today uh, and certainly actionable things that, that lots of dealers can take back to their organizations. What a great panel, Sarah. I took a lot of notes and uh, just uh, really enthused about the year ahead uh, for BDC and learning from all of your learnings uh, in the past year. So, uh, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for putting the panel together. And I want to uh, thank this panel, uh, Bill Demery at Tom Wood. Thank you so much for all you do. Andy Wright at Vinart. Thank you so much, my friend. Great to have you on the roundtable. Great to have you with us. Elizabeth Martin. Congratulations again, and thank you so much, and uh, appreciate all your insight and your helper there as well. So love it. Uh, Brian, great to have you on the roundtable. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully the first of many. And uh, Nikki, uh, thank you so much. Uh, same to you as well. So hope to have you back for many, many more of these. So uh, very impressive, everybody. The year ahead for your BDC panel here today with Sarah Van Tyne at the Fixed Ops Roundtable.